of DSC. Uh, specifically, I'll share some uh, real-world experiences. Uh, my name is uh, Jan Eglering. I work as a lead architect on the infrastructure team at the Crayon, a uh, consulting and licensing team in uh, a company in Norway. I work with uh, mainly with Microsoft infrastructure with a strong focus on automation. You might have seen some of my articles on the PowerShell magazine, the Crayon services blog or the Norwegian TechNet blog. I'm also at uh, Twitter as at Jan Eglering. So I'll share the contact info and the URLs to the slides and the code after at the end of the session. So uh, in this session I want to share some, this is not like the answer on how to do it, but this is kind of the first step in the journey. Uh, like if you were at uh, Steven's talk on Monday, he said that it's just not a single switch from uh, the old way to the new DevOps way. You have to do it step by step. So this is kind of the first step on the journey for this environment I'm going to talk to you about now. So you'll see how uh, how DSC is implemented there using uh, integrations with existing solutions such as SMA or service management uh, automation uh, and so on. Uh, the project started based on the VMF4, uh, specifically with the November 2014 update. Uh, but there are features in the VMF5 pre preview that we are evaluating because there are uh, mainly bug fixes but also a lot of new functionalities that we want to leverage. Um, also, an important concept around the configuration management in general is how to handle the configuration data. Um, since this solution is not based on uh, a configuration management product such as uh, Chef or Ansible or uh, Puppet or so on, but it's rather a custom solution built on top of the DSC platform, we had a lot of trial and error going, finding out how to do, do things. So I think what we have now is a step in the right direction, but I'm sure there are room for improvement. So I'll uh, hopefully have a few minutes. Uh, left at the end so we can have a discussion around it to hear other experiences on if you did something similar or, or and so on. Uh, so a little bit about the background. Uh, this was uh, cr uh, crafted at a customer in Norway which is uh, they have a number of production plants spread across the country so they have like 1000 servers in total and 5000 users I guess in the US or European uh, uh, it's not that large, but in Norway it's a fairly large uh, company. They are mostly Windows, but they also have a few Linux uh, servers. And Hyper-V is the primary virtualization platform. As I said, the customer have a number of production plants uh, spread across the whole Norway. Uh, and there they had on uh, all the production plants, they had old servers that were going to be replaced by, by new hardware. So the old ones were running on physical operating systems, but the new ones were being replaced by two Hyper-V hosts where we were uh, leveraging Hyper-V replica to replicate VMs from one server to the other one in order to have uh, high availability on the, on the hardware level. Uh, so in this uh, case, uh, costs for high availability related to storage, clustering and uh, so on, it was too large. Uh, too high for the smaller production plants. So here we have just two single servers using Hyper-V replica. And the larger ones we are <coughs> using uh, uh, clustering on the uh, shared storage. <coughs> so this was uh, kind of the first place that we wanted to if we thought of if we started out with a project there to deploy all these servers because it was uh, like 30 physical sites we were going to deploy this to. So we have 30 times 2, it's 60 physical servers. And on each server, there were going to be created three virtual machines that was going to be replicated to the, sec uh, to the second servers. So when you add all that up, it will become a relatively large number of servers that we want configured in a consistent manner. We don't want to install things manually, we want it uh, all to be the same. So we thought that this was a good, uh, good place to start uh, implementing uh, configuration management in production. So that's why we started with uh, 
DSC on the physical Hyper-V host. That's kind of our first step. So I'm coming, coming to talk a little bit more in the end about the next step, about bringing DSC into the VMs and so on. But for this uh, demonstration, it will be applied to the Hyper-V host. A little bit about the infrastructure. Um, as you all do, I have everyone in this room played with DSC before. I think uh, pretty, pretty much half the room maybe. Uh, as you probably um, know, uh, there are a few phases to DSC. Uh, first, you have to create a configuration. You can do it in PowerShell or you can do it in, uh, in uh, an environment basically because you have to produce this MOF file somehow which will describe to the system how the how things are going to be configured. For this example, we are just using the declarative language in PowerShell to create this MOF file. You can use push mode and just push it to the ESC client, or you can use Apple server. So that's what we did in uh, this scenario. We created the uh, Apple server, and instead of manually sitting and uh, generating these MOF files, we were using automation in order to to put the MOF files onto the server. Uh, and also we are using uh, Git, of course. This is, my main experience with Git in the production was actually this project. So I know that I've used it for um, a year, year and a half. I, I just can't understand how I could live without it before because it's so, so useful. Um, question? That's a local repository, right? Yeah, this is a local uh, repository. We're running a GitLab uh, locally at the customer. Uh, so the automation part here, that is uh, SMA. So we have runbooks, uh, workflow-based runbooks in SMA that I is importing modules containing the configurations. So I'm going to, to show you that. So basically, during the build process, because this was also a large uh, SMA project that a, co a colleague of mine was doing, we created the uh, PowerShell uh, workflows in SMA to deploy for, uh, from uh, virtual machine monitor using bare metal deployment. So the physical servers was uh, getting the operating system from VMM, and all configurations was done through runbooks in uh, in uh, SMA. So from those runbooks, we could call the ESC configurations and dynamically apply those during the provisioning process, so that we don't have to manually do something when a new server is, uh, is pushed out. Question? Uh, resources, what you did about do about them? Uh, we leveraged many DSC resources from the community on the DSC resource kit, but we also built some, some ourselves. <coughs> I'm going to show you the whole structure and the resources that we built. So that's most mostly all of the PowerPoints, I think. I'm going to show you how the environment is uh, this setup. So if you just jump into the repository, we have this like yesterday, we also have this, excuse me, duplicate. Um, we have a Git repository. Now I've made a replica of the environment in, uh, in uh, my employer's environment. So this is from the demo environment at Crayon where I work. So it's mainly the <coughs> same, same structure as we built at the customer. So what we're going to look at now is the structure that we have in the repository. Uh, here I've just opened that in uh, Visual Studio Code because it's just uh, easy to, to explore the folder structure and look at the, the files. So if we start at the top, uh, the first one here, uh, this dot settings, that's just uh, Visual Studio Code, uh, the settings for that, so that's not part of the solution. But we're going to explore the rest of them here. Sorry, we make it bigger. A bit bigger. Let me see. Is there an a zoom in Visual Studio Code or zoom in? Zoom in. Yeah. Is it better or there? Yeah. Yes. There we go. Uh, so if you start uh, looking at the configurations, um, the LCM configuration. It's just uh, a plain module. So here we have created just a configuration having uh, parameters for what we need. Uh, the node name, the certificate ID, config ID, and the URL to the build server that is injected into the, the meta configuration. So this uh, module here is dynamically loaded into the SMA runbook. So 
so that's uh, used from there. I'm going to show you the run uh, afterwards. Uh, then we have this uh, Hyper-V configuration. Here we have leveraged uh, uh, composite resources. So we have uh, some resources for uh, base configurations and we have some Hyper-V specific configurations. So this one is uh, doing uh, things like uh, firewall rules and all base settings that we want to apply to all servers. Well, the second one is uh, specific to Hyper-V. So here we get the things uh, injected dynamically. For example, what Active Directory group uh, is uh, who is going to be local administrators, local Hyper-V administrators, and so on. And then some uh, Hyper-V specific things. Uh, we also have some at uh, some of the larger production plants uh, scale out file servers. So that's what we also started building configurations for, but this is not uh, not 100% uh, complete yet. Uh, then for the environments, uh, at the beginning we used just uh, plain PSD1 files and uh, also we used push in the beginning when we were eva evaluating and testing stuff. But uh, uh, going further, we needed something that was a little bit uh, more scalable and we wanted to use the customer's existing uh, ser server database, which was uh, Service Manager. So now we are getting all this information dynamically from Service Manager. I'm going to show you a little bit later. Uh, we had a separate PSD1 file for the production and the test environment, but these aren't in use anymore. Now I've defined uh, things in a JSON format instead, which I found a little bit easier. So here we have uh, environments and we have a collection of environments. For example, here we have the production environment with the, the URLs and all the values for DNS servers and all these variables. Also, what kind of servers are used in the solution, for example. Uh, these values, this is what I push all the modules to because you need uh, the modules to be up to date on the servers that you are going to author configurations on. That's what I call DSE management servers and also the SMA worker servers, the runbook servers that will actually generate the uh, files. So I uh, get the, the values from these two and ensure that the modules are up to date on those. Also the users collection here is just something I used to get uh, the path to the local Git repository because one of my main goals with this uh, project was not to hard code anything. I want everything to be variables so that I can, can just specify the, the hard coded the paths and stuff like that down here. So this is basically the same for the test environment. It's just another uh, thing in the array in the JSON file with the uh, URLs for the test environment. So none of these values is hard-coded inside the, the other things I'm showing here. So this is the configuration data for the environment that actually is running the service that are running the management service and the SMA server, is that correct? Yeah, this is the, the variables for not only for DSC but also for the, the complete solution if you will for SMA and where I push stuff. But uh, also some of these things is uh, going into the the DSE configuration data, for example, this is a path for installing some software. So these are also getting into the, the PSD ones, if you will. It will be a little bit clearer when I show you the, the rest there. Uh, let's uh, have a look at the modules. Um, here we have the DSE resources. Uh, here is, uh, yeah, you will recognize many of them is uh, gotten from the DSE resource kit. But I uh, also build a couple of them uh, or made changes to some existing ones. For example, the, the Logman one, which is on the gallery, which is basically for importing a performance monitor template. So that is uh, every Wednesday, I think, it will run a data collector set for 12 hours and upload it, uh, upload it to a central location so that we have a weekly baseline of the Hyper-V servers. Uh, that's one of those I created myself, and I also made some changes or customizations to, I think, VM host, which is for configuring Hyper-V settings, and the one for configuring Windows update mode. Uh, then I also created this helper module, which is uh, basically 
some functions for, uh, yeah, you saw that I'm using JSON here. So this one will convert the JSON uh, content into basically the PSD1 format that uh, the SE want with the all nodes and the non-node data and so on. Uh, then you have some things I've gotten from the community. Uh, for example, this one uh, is from uh, created based on a blog post on the PowerShell team blog for acquiring the pull server to get the node status. So here there are uh, yeah, converting the values into text strings and so on. Uh, for getting the encryption certificates. Um, like uh, you probably know, it's kind of a pain to manage certificates uh, when you're going to encrypt credentials in DSE. You have to have a certificate on the nodes and you have to, to get a copy of the of the public key. Uh, in this environment, we have a PKI solution, so all managed nodes was having certificates in place via group policy. So all I had to do was to query the node using partial remoting and get the same print of the certificate or export the certificate, basically. Person. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, you're, you're, so you're still using group policies to actually... Yeah, we are in the, there are some stuff in group policy uh, because we didn't just want to rip out all that they had in place because there are some older Hyper-V servers that is not in, uh, in uh, the SE management yet. So this is kind of the first step. But uh, the goal would ultimately be to uh, replace group policy with the DSC configuration CPU. Uh, then we have this Git environment data, which I will show you in a demo afterwards, which will basically query the Git repository to get the JSON file that I showed you earlier on. So here I'm using invoke REST method, and that will, since this is a JSON file, it will automatically convert it into a PowerShell object. So that's uh, that's a nice uh, way, I believe, to, to get the data dynamically for the environment. So based on the DNS domain of the user you are logged onto the computer with, you would get settings, for example, when I'm in the test environment, I will only get the settings for that domain. When I'm in the production domain, I will get the settings for that, that domain. Uh, I'll show you all the demos how they work afterwards, I'll just go through the, the main ones. Uh, so other stuff here, as I said, a lot of it is uh, taken from the community, so I'm trying to leave traces for where I got stuff from, so I just don't pick and choose. It's good to leave a, a reference to the source, but uh, many of them I've uh, built myself also. For example, for building composite resources, uh, this excellent function from Ashley McLean over at Microsoft. Uh, test PS remoting from lead holds, which I use for test if the node is available when I'm going to apply the meta configuration. Uh, and this one is also kind of interesting. Uh, I had some thoughts when I, during the summit, on how to to get the local uh, versions of modules and configurations updated. The way we do it in the the first. Uh, step on our journey is that we just have everything stored in a central C part and from uh, from uh, basically the IT Pro workstation we get changes from the Git repository and just push it to the central location. So a UNC part is kind of where the run book workers get the updated uh, configurations. But uh, yeah, as I'm going to get into at the end of the presentations, uh, I saw the uh, Git or source control integration in Azure Automation, which is probably a much better solution. So, so there are room for improvements here. So that's basically the helper module. Uh, let's see. Then we have the composites. Uh, like I said, we have our base composite resource, which have uh, yeah, uh, remote desktop. Uh, firewall rules, Windows update mode, and so on. And then we have the Hyper-V specific uh, configuration. Here we have the settings for the Hyper-V host to enhance session mode, number of migration stuff. That, that is settings that is specific to, to Hyper-V. Then we have a similar one for 
scaled up file server, for example, there, there are some different settings you want to, to <coughs> tweak or install some other roles and stuff like that. So that was basically the modules that we have in the solution. Then there are the SMA runbooks. So during the provisioning process, uh, there are mainly four runbooks that are being run. It's the one which will install the operating system. It's one which will configure networking. Uh, one which will configure the host and one which will deploy the three default virtual machines. So during one of those runbooks, you can dynamically inject uh, these runbooks as well for configuring uh, first configuring DSC, the meta configuration. So here we just uh, we use uh, SMA variables a lot. So the the SMA variables you see here, those are dynamically being injected into SMA based on the JSON document that I showed you earlier on, and then they are uh, gathered here at the top of the runbook. So if you look a little bit more down here, we get the uh, get uh, the parameters for the instances dynamically. So we have two modes. We have uh, one which is kind of a manual mode where we get the information from our JSON file, which is easier for testing and stuff like that. And we have another mode where we will get the parameters from System Center Service Manager. So there are two different runbooks. So RBID and uh, runbook ID, if that is specified, we will just try to see if we can find a JSON file with the parameters for that instance. If not, we will we will uh, get it from Service Manager. When the parameters is retrieved, <coughs> we will uh, import the configuration modules and the helper module from the uh, variable the parts that is configured in the variables. And when that is done, we will for each host go and see if uh, they are available. Basically, if we can reach them using remoting will get the encryption certificate. Uh, then we will run the configuration. <coughs> this will configure, uh, create the meta.mof file. And here we will basically apply the configuration. And uh, at the bottom, I think we also trigger an uh, update DSC configuration on the node. So it will go to the pod server and get its configuration. So, but before that one is run, we are actually generating the configuration for the node. So that's what's being done in this other runbook. So here we will get the parameters either from JSON or Service Manager. Then we will import the modules which contains the composite modules, the helper module and so on. And then we will go on and uh, yeah, basically get the certificates and generate the configuration. So we have uh, here is the actual uh, uh, configuration. So there are a few other runbook services relevant if you want to get information from Service Manager or that uh, JSON file. Uh, then I also have this utility folder. Um, I like to create kind of uh, yeah these templates for uh, when you're doing operations and when you're doing authoring stuff like that. So these files I'm just going to show you in the ISC and run some code instead of just showing it. So if you start by looking at uh, the author interface. Here at the top I'm importing the helper module. And here we have this get environment data that I showed you which will get use invoke REST method and get the JSON file from the repository. So now in this environment data variable, if I access the contents, you will see that I have uh, all of the variables from the JSON file. A little bit bigger. So now we can see that I'm in the production environment defined and I'm not retrieving anything else. If I'm running the exact same command in the test environment, all of this var all of these values will be for that environment. So that's that's kind of neat to be able to dynamically get all the contents based on where you are located. This way we don't have to hard code anything in inside the files you can use basically all of the same files wherever we are so here i'm just storing for example the user data from that uh, file so in dollar user data i will have the settings for my user so if you had a different <coughs> user 
uh, specified in that file and you were logged on with a different user, you would get your personal settings. <coughs> Yeah, so I'm just creating a few other variables for where we are storing stuff. So this is uh, this is the authoring uh, document. So this is where I go f as a starting point when I'm doing uh, authoring of either configurations <coughs> or or uh, DSC resources. I also left in here some uh, tips and tricks and things you in case you haven't. Uh, Heard of this show DSC resource, for example? It's an add on for PowerShell ISE that will basically just uh, uh, show you the DSC resource in an add on and load it here. I think it's someone on the PowerShell team that created it actually. Is it it's on the far left? That's not important. It's a it's a very useful uh, add-on to check out. Uh, so yeah, here we have some templates for creating new composite resources, uh, yeah, working with the gallery, creating new modules, creating new resources. This is not class-based, but the old way, uh, the script-based resources. Also the V5 version. So this is kind of like a cheat sheet or starting point for getting started uh, with authoring. Uh, then we have this operations uh, <coughs> file, which is uh, much of the same things. This is where we go to uh, troubleshoot or see that everything is working as expected. Can uh, specify the computer name and inspect the uh, LCM, test DLC, uh, enable debug logging or verbose logging. And uh, yeah. Operation stuff basically. Uh, one thing I forgot there was uh, the poll server. The, this is from the helper module that I showed you. So, for example, here, instead of just hard coding the URI, I'm just pointing at the environment data on the property URI. It's gotten from there. So, the same scripts can be used either in the test environment or the production environment. Uh, then you have SMA. Uh, and the same thing goes here, for example, the web service endpoint for SMA, it's not hard coded, we're just getting it from the environment data. And uh, this is kind of the starting point for, yeah, this is a runbook for synchronizing runbooks from the local repository into SMA, so we don't have to manually import or update the runbooks, we just uh, work directly against the, against the local GIF repository. And also this is uh, for manually starting uh, runbooks when you're doing development or testing. You can start it with uh, in SCSM input mode or JSON input mode as I call it here. Uh, that's SMA and yeah, also at the end there you can see that I have uh, for configuring all the SMA variables, you get all the information from the JSON file, so you don't have to do it manually. You can just run this whole thing in the test environment and in the production environment, and it will update all of the variables in the in SMA. Uh, then we have this sync DSE version control data, which is uh, something that we're using now, but uh, as I mentioned, we will probably replace it by some other mechanism. But here we are basically just uh, calling this update folder function I wrote, which will basically just wipe the central folder and replace it with updated content from the from the Git repository. So this is uh, this is a script that you can just hit a uh, five and run. But I'm just going to show you quickly that we're copying the DSC resources, we're copying the DSC configurations, uh, we're copying uh, the environment data. And also here is where I copy the, re the modules. So here, for example, if we get this notes value here, you can see that we have the, all the servers for this environment, all the SMA worker servers and the DSC management servers. So all of these three will get updated, the DSC modules when we run this. 
And uh, lastly, it's for uh, updating the poll server. If you have created a new version of a DSC resource, when you run this, it will uh, automatically just upload that uh, latest version to the poll server. So this is also a, a function in the helper module. Yeah, I don't think we're going to do any RDP demos at the summit, but uh, this is uh, what I do when I demo this to customers. Just log on to a box and see that uh, it actually got applied. Uh, also back to the slides again. Just to show you a little, uh, a few screenshots from uh, how it looks uh, from the end user perspective. Uh, this is a few screenshots from uh, Service Manager. Uh, so here we have created three custom classes in Service Manager. One for sites, which is basically the physical location of the production plant. One is instances, which can be a single server. It can be a pair of two Hyper-V replica servers, or it can be a Hyper-V cluster, for example. Uh, and then we have the Hyper-V hosts. So inside the site, you will have one or more instances, and inside the hosts, you will have a host which is attached to an instance. So here you have examples for, for example, uh, properties for a site, uh, properties for an instance, the name of the default uh, virtual machines, if it will be, if they will be deployed, the default virtual machines, and IP addresses for a host, what local administrators should be on that host. So this is properties that is being dynamically read by the SMA runbooks and fed in or injected into the DSC configuration. So basically this is what uh, what gets into the DSC configuration data. So since the customer is using Service Manager, we found that to be the most appropriate place to have have this data stored. So so far it's it's been working pretty good. And then now the front end. Uh, we have uh, from uh, a third party called Cyrison, which I might have heard of, which have a, a portal uh, or a front end, if you will, to service monitor. So when the end user in this case, which is, an, which is an IT pro operator at the customer who will actually deploy a couple of new servers, he will first have to go into the portal and re register. Uh, first, you need to register the site if it's not in the database. Uh, register an instance of the two Hyper-V servers, for example, and then register the, the Hyper-V servers themselves. For example, the, the ILO address for connecting to the console. <coughs> that will be used by uh, SCVMM to perform the OS deployment and so on. So when the registering part is done, uh, we have divided it into four steps, as I said. The first one being the, the deployment phase, where the, uh, where the operating system will get deployed. Here we have uh, the networking, uh, the configuration of the Hyper-V host. I think it's in this part we will inject the DSC configurations. And lastly, deploying standard VMs. Here we could have just had a big red button that said deploy, but uh, we chose to to divide it into parts so that if something goes wrong, it's easier to just continue where you left off. So between each of these phases, the person responsible <coughs> for the deployment must <coughs> check that it's okay. If that's okay, go on to the next one, go on to the next one. So this is basically how it looks from, from the end user perspective in, in this case. Uh, so, as I said, um, we have some thoughts or ideas for how we will improve this. For example, one of the main parts is the internal power, PowerShell uh, knowledge at the customer. I will run some uh, PowerShell workshops and classes uh, this fall to get it to get them more up to speed because this it's very important that it's not getting dependent on one person. This should be something that the customer can can manage themselves. Uh, then we also have thoughts about uh, extending it to different uh, server roles. Now the solution is pretty much built for Hyper-V servers only, but that's kind of one of the next phases to build it so that we can have roles for web servers, application servers, and so on. 
Uh, then we want to look more into Azure Automation GSC. Uh, the customer has already started to evaluate and use Azure for other purposes. Uh, but for Azure Automation, based on at least what I saw in Joe's uh, session there, it's very um, interesting to maybe use Azure Automation as a build server because you get so many features. You, you get more of a visual experience as well. You can log into the portal and see the configurations so that a person which is not up to speed with, uh, with PowerShell can go in and see the reporting, for example, if the nodes are compliant or not. Uh, then we also need to think more about robustness and think about the structure. Um, as I said, for example, uh, clone the Git repository on the SMA servers instead of manually pushing it to a file share, which is being read by the SMA Chromebook servers. Uh, and also I haven't uh, looked into tester or a t testing framework yet, so there are a lot of things that we should do, but this is kind of where we are right now. Uh, so uh, before we end, I have uh, brought up this uh, discussion points. Uh, so to take the first one, uh, have you done anything similar or do anyone have any experiences to share on the pain points or things that have been working? Or have you not started using DSE in production at all? Or no, 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 most people are still in the evaluation phase because there are. It's a more major product in uh, version five. Uh, it's not all about that, but uh, for our part, we felt that it was important to just get started and find a use case for it, which was the the Hyper-V deployment. So um, you, you talked about using a, a third-party front end for the actual user experience. Mm -hmm. So um, when we talked earlier, we talked about using the Azure Pack as that experience. Is, is, did I understand it correctly? <coughs> yeah, the Azure Pack, that's uh, front end to SMA itself for uh, mm -hmm. invoking runbooks. So you could just do that and log directly into the SMA Windows Azure Pack portal and start the runbooks from there. But in this case, we wanted to leverage Service Manager as kind of the configuration management database. So that's the natural place to go for the IT operator to do stuff in this case. But you could have just have, an, have all the configuration data in flat files, for example, or in SQL. It's kind of what you, what you want to do. Could you also uh, service manager you put information about the configuration of the machine? Yeah. Could you also put in the GUID? Uh, good question. Uh, I forgot to mention that uh, as the node grid for the nodes on the build server, we're actually using the ID from Service Manager because when you create a host in Service Manager, it automatically uh, automatically will get this ID, which is a grid. So we just use that. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. We're, we're actually doing something similar. Mm -hmm. That's kind of fun. Yeah. Either we're both doing it wrong or we're... Yeah, 50-50. <laughs> In terms of, of changing configuration, I mean, if you update the configuration, what's the rollout strategy of the kind of... Uh, we first try to test everything in the test environment. So we have some test Hyper-V servers we are deploying configurations and testing it to. Then we copy it uh, or copy it to the production environment and roll it out there via the build server. Did you just tell the nodes that, all oh, right, this is your new configuration, go ahead, apply? Yeah, yeah. Do you chunk it up in terms of, you know, maybe they need reboots and service? We haven't actually done that major changes that require that kind of uh, reboots or anything like that. So that's, we don't have a clear strategy on that yet, but... Uh, Neither do we. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's an interesting topic. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, yeah. Then uh, if you have any other questions with the de uh, specific details uh, of our environment, just hit me up afterwards. So um, here you have the contact information. You can get hit me on Twitter on this uh, address. There I will, uh, if the Twitter scheduling cards are with us, I will already have shared their content from. You have. Uh, I have. Good. <laughs> so just uh, check, uh, follow me on Twitter or search. You will find the URLs there. So they are also here, but these are basically shared on Twitter. So I've shared all of the code on uh, GitHub, 
on this DSC Hyper-V demo repository. Also some interesting reads regarding Hyper-V. Also, so I don't remember his name, uh, he created this PS deploy module, which was also kind of interesting to, to look at how things can be done. Yeah, thank you very much.